stream. We are live from IMF Spring Meetings. My name is Jacqueline Villalba Arroyo, and I am joined by Ksenia Pavlovic. Ksenia Pavlovic is actually the editor-in-chief and founder of the independent news media, The Pavlovic Today. The Pavlovic Today is part of the White House Press Corps, and today we are going to discuss uh, some very open topics. And Ksenia, welcome. Uh, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jacqueline. Go ahead, ask for everyone. All right, awesome. So we are here at the IMS Spring Meetings, which is a very predominantly male kind of environment. And you're also, you know, at the White House, which is also a predominantly male environment. So what's it like to be a woman in the White House uh, in the context of the Me Too movement? Oh, great question. Well, thank you. Uh, it's already hard to be a woman. Uh, in today's world, uh, but it's even harder to be a female journalist and then probably even more harder to be a White House correspondent and to work in such a male-dominated environment. Um, however, I feel empowered. Um, the ladies who are in the, in the White House press corps, my uh, fellow women, mm -hmm. uh, they're all very strong, very opinionated, uh, mm -hmm. and they feel equal with uh, male uh, correspondents. Uh, in the context of the Me Too movement, I feel that, especially in the White House press corps, mm -hmm. all uh, women are very strong and vocal, and uh, they would not allow for anything like that to happen mm -hmm. to them. I believe that especially this group we have in the White House press corps uh, would be the first one to raise their voice against mm -hmm. uh, something like that happening. However, uh, I believe that the Me Too movement has given us um, to all women, not only in journalism mm -hmm. profession, but across industries, a more opportunity to speak up against, uh, you know, violence, um, harassment, mm -hmm. um, some kind of. Um, misuse of power in a workplace, mm -hmm. which are all very important topics and uh, we need to be very vocal about it. And we have also heard about the domestic violence happening within uh, the administration of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, it was the journalists who, who basically broke the story and, and raised the issue and made them accountable to or at least to pay attention mm -hmm. to what was going on among their ranks. So as, as far uh, as the White House press corps, I'm very happy uh, about um, the unity of all women uh, in the White House press corps. And uh, if we can lead the way and we can, if we can raise the issue, mm -hmm. if we can speak up against uh, any kind of harassment um, in the society, then uh, we are going to do that mm -hmm. for sure. Well, that's like, that's incredible to hear. That's awesome. So, you know, speaking about um, the White House, and um, so how's it different to cover this event, which is a very global event, and how does it compare to the White House and your coverage there? Oh, that's an excellent question. Well, you can only compare uh, the White House. The coverage and the coverage of the global event like mm -hmm. spring meetings at IMF and World Bank if you have this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that respect, I'm coming from the background where uh, we are having a never-ending news cycle. Mm -hmm. Here at the IMF, as you can see, it's uh, very much relaxed. The issues are more global in scope and um, it's possible to cover anything from um, universal health coverage to Me Too movement to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. to global policies, poverty. However, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that there is a less accountability here. Mm -hmm. uh, being a White House correspondent is, I believe, despite all the difficulties mm -hmm. that we are having right now, the best job in the world if you ask me right now, mm -hmm. because this role of the White House correspondent comes with a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you have this sense of urgency, you're asking hard questions, you need to be all the time switched on, 
you need to be present. These are all very um, important uh, issues, uh, while here um, it's more like uh, corporate uh, journalism. It is not something that I would be able to do all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I like uh, to be involved in issues like these at least once per year mm -hmm. uh, because uh, also of my background mm -hmm. in uh, international relations and, and global politics. So from that point of view, it's important for me but I would never trade places with the White House press corps. Definitely. So you seem very passionate about uh, you know, being in the press corps and, and so I'm really wondering how did you come up with the idea of founding the Pavlovic Today and starting it? Yeah, well I started Pavlovic Today in the middle of the US election. Why? Uh, I was at that time at Yale University and I was encountering lots of young people incredibly smart young people with incredible ideas, bold point of views, creative solutions, and really um, a stand as to what's happening in their country. And uh, they wanted to bring in to their voice into conversation, and I felt that a platform that is completely independent, which means uh, that is um, disseminating expert opinion and intellectual uh, thought independent mm -hmm. of any partisanship uh, was missing uh, in uh, our um, political landscape and that was the reason why I founded Pavlovic today mm -hmm. and uh, I keep uh, running my uh, publication mm -hmm. which is completely independent of any uh, partisan politics mm -hmm. but is also very critical of what is going on right now and in that sense, that is something that is new, that is very new in a sense that um, the way of politics is polarized right now, you need to fit into left or, all, or right from the center. That's how everyone wants to basically box you in, which I think it's okay to some extent, but there is a problem because sometimes politics is not black and white. Definitely. So you can be liberal about certain issues, but maybe you want to take conservative view on some other issues. Mm -hmm. And you want to give people the truth from the standpoint of someone who, who knows what they are talking about. And this is why I bring in all the um, analysts and uh, experts and people who have been studying journalism uh, or political science or, or global politics and they spend years and years and years studying these particular subjects so I'm giving them a platform mm -hmm. to provide their expert opinion and analysis. Yes, that's that, that's incredible to just have that uh, expertise and for them to give their you know their analysis their opinions is incredibly important for today's time. And also, one thing that really stands out about the Pavlovic today is that it's very focused on giving voice to young millennials and Generation Z uh, youth. So um, I'm wondering what inclined you to give them that voice. Thank you first for noticing that as also a young uh, person and the future of this country. Uh, well, like I said, I first felt the need for that when I was uh, teaching at Yale University because being surrounded with young people mm -hmm. uh, who are so passionate about the happenings in this country, um, for me it was a it, w it gave me a clear signal that mm -hmm. this is something that needs to happen because they do not have the outlet. They write for mm -hmm. their um, student newspapers or they, um, they write in academia, mm -hmm. but they do not have a newspaper, they don't have media mm -hmm. that is allowing them mm -hmm. to, to voice their expertise and, and views about the world, which are very di diverse. Mm -hmm. um, that was from the professional standpoint, mm -hmm. right. But from my personal standpoint, uh, because I see myself in them, mm -hmm. because I was once that person, and I know very well that when I was a young uh, journalist, mm -hmm. that it was the youth who really made a change 
and took a stand for democracy, took a stand for free press. And uh, this is why I always support the youth. And uh, what they always tell me is that I treat them equally. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is because I value someone's opinion. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to wait for this youth to, you know, be on the basically stand by for the next 10 years and right. then ask them, oh, what do you mm -hmm. think? No, the, the future starts now right. and their future has already started. And you and, 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 and young people like yourself, you are going to lead this country and this world in 10 years from now. So why not ask you, what is the future you want to create? Right. So that's what yeah, I think in the and that's like so relevant to today's uh, events because you know a few weeks ago we saw the March for Our Lives coming uh, here in DC, in DC and you know for those students you know Emma Gonzalez David Hogg uh, for them to have organized that so so fast and so strategically for a movement that they really believe in and support and I think that that's really powerful for you to do being uh, someone that supports them in, in that sense so thank you for that um, You're welcome always. <laughs> so I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, what's it like to be an independent news media in the White House when the administration at th this current time has taken the position so strongly against the media? It's not easy. Um, I always want to be truthful about the situation we are having in the White House press corps. And being able to, to also be a journalist uh, in different venues outside the White House, I can say that in the White House is the place where we can uh, have the most impact and we can make the government, not only of the United States, but the government through all around the world accountable for their actions. So in that sense, uh, it is not easy. Um, and this administration in particular has a very specific understanding of the press. Mm -hmm. They believe that we are there to contribute to their publicity, mm -hmm. which is not the case. But you have to understand that Trump is coming from the corporate world where he has used to bend the world his way, mm -hmm. at, at least his world. Mm -hmm. And the way he understands the press is that they need to write or that we need to write what he wants us to write and that is not the purpose of journalism and everyone uh, uh, especially in the White House press corps is going to probably share uh, that sentiment because for us and I, I feel like I can speak on behalf of my profession for us is not about whether you are a Democrat or whether you are a Republican but are you doing your job mm -hmm. in a way that is in the best interest for this country, mm -hmm. for these people you are serving right now. So that is something that I find um, to be very difficult to do uh, in today's mm -hmm. political environment, especially as uh, we have a president who is all the time uh, reducing the trust mm -hmm. in media. Mm -hmm. And that is something that um, we need to speak again. Mm -hmm. uh, not because we have something against Donald Trump, but because we are the watchdog of the fourth state. We are mm -hmm. the fourth state. So if we reduce uh, the press freedoms, mm -hmm. if, you, if we allow reduction of press freedoms in the White House press corps, what is then going to happen in the rest of the world? What is going to happen in other countries? Because everyone is watching what is going on in the White House press corps. And in that sense, uh, this job uh, is difficult, mm -hmm. but it's also very rewarding and it's mm -hmm. very empowering. And uh, we also know that um, when we make something to be an issue, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think President knows that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you brought a good point about how you know Donald Trump's coming from a, a very corporate world and he wants to bend the news his way, right? And so I've actually noticed that on his uh, Facebook profile, he posts videos that are very, um, like, news coverage, but they're created by his people, by his team. So what do you think about this, and is it problematic? Well, of course, if he's um, 
Donald Trump private citizen, a businessman, that is what his corporate publicity department is doing, his publicity department, the Trump organization. Mm -hmm. But once you become the president of the United States, you cannot do that because if you do that, then that's propaganda. Mm -hmm. And propaganda is not something that should be part of the values of the United States of America. This country doesn't do it like that. Maybe in Russia, maybe in China, maybe in Iran, <laughs> they have their own North Korea, they have their own uh, media, basically, and their own uh, publicity machine, mm -hmm. and they control uh, what gets published. But here in this country, we do it in a different way. Definitely. So, you know, you, you spoke earlier about how, you know, through your own experiences, you saw uh, the power in youth. And a lot of that's because you have a very diverse worldview from living through war, war, political strife, and you have a lot of experience through turbulent political times. So how do you compare the Trump administration to other political leadership styles that you've seen and experienced? Well, leadership style of Donald Trump is not something that America is used to, definitely. Not modern America, at least. And especially after Obama, who was a very, you know, well-posed, mm -hmm. soft-spoken, um, extremely educated president. Mm -hmm. So this now comes as a shock to most of Americans, mm -hmm. to Europeans, this doesn't come as a shock because Europe had a history in dictatorships mm -hmm. and dealing with leaders like that. Um, mm -hmm. What I can say for a fact that I see elements of um, a leadership style that um, autocrats have mm -hmm. in, in Donald J. Trump. Mm -hmm. To what extent um, he is going to adjust that or not, um, it is a question for him. Uh, what I would uh, recommend to him would be to educate himself more mm -hmm. about uh, ins and outs, ins and outs of uh, responsible democratic political leadership, mm -hmm. and make sure he makes the statement that they're not suppressing civil liberties. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to put out a statement that you want James Comey to be, you know, thrown behind the bars because whether or not we like it or not, or whether they like it or not, mm -hmm. James Comey today is the private citizen and he's mm -hmm. exercising his first amendment rights mm -hmm. to free speech and he can say his version or his truth or his story, whatever you want to call it, but he has the right to do that. Um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, other uh, things, uh, what really I believe is very problematic right now is his relationship, Trump's relationship to uh, criticism that mm -hmm. is coming from the media. Mm -hmm. uh, he needs to be able to take in criticism and mm -hmm. probably learn something uh, from mm -hmm. that criticism. Because there are many smart people right now mm -hmm. who are criticizing him. Uh, so it's up to him to decide how he wants to take this scene, whether he wants to take it as a war or he wants to take it as a way to learn something and to grow and at least, you know, establish you know some uh, criteria for civil debate uh, in in, uh, in 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 the media in in public uh, arena. Let's say mm -hmm. yes. Well, yes, definitely. The Trump's kind of view on media is it's one that's very you know interesting to look at. But one thing that really stood out early and uh, when he came into office is his ban on. Uh, you know, off-camera ban. Like, journalists can no longer live stream, you know, what was going on and press briefings and such. So, but you actually did something and you stood up for the First Amendment. You live streamed uh, that briefing. And so what made you do it when other big media corporations did it? Well, first and foremost, um, the defense. Mm -hmm of the universal rights of the First Amendment is of decisive importance to me and I believe to every single person in the United States. So this was the starting point 
The second point is that I was hoping that my actions mm -hmm. are going to um, contribute to a greater transparency mm -hmm. of the government and for upholding the American values mm -hmm. in the people's house. And that is something that uh, I personally and strongly believe was the right mm -hmm. thing to do. And for me, that was never a question to stand up for that because I grew up in the environment when where people didn't have those rights. Mm -hmm. And I grew up watching at America mm -hmm. as a stronghold of hope, of freedom, right. of transparency, of mm -hmm. open government. And sometimes we need to basically remind ourselves that right. these freedoms didn't come just, you know, with no price. Mm -hmm. There were generations of people who came, who went before us, mm -hmm. who made this possible today in this country. And for me, it was always something about United States of America as the last station that every journalist who is basically working in, um, in environments or, or, or established working in the environment, political, political landscape uh, with, with very few uh, press freedoms that they were always, you know, hoping that one day they're going to come to the United States to do their job in a way that it's not going to make them fear. So that is something that is very uh, important for me and was never questioned. Why the corporations uh, didn't do what I did? I, I spoke to that, but to sum up, I believe that uh, big corporations, mm -hmm. they have many stakeholders uh, to account to. Mm -hmm. Their decision-making process uh, moves much slower than when it comes to the um, independent, uh, media company like uh, is the Pavlovic position. I was able to, to make that decision on the spot because I didn't have board directors I need to answer to. I'm my own uh, decision maker. And that is uh, a situation where if you have a small media, mm -hmm. you can actually create change. Uh, you don't need to be a very uh, big corporation mm -hmm in order to make change. Mm -hmm. And that is something that uh, Peter Thiel said, and that is, if, uh, just because you're small, doesn't mean that you're non-existent. So we all mm -hmm. have a voice, and I believe in the right of every single journalist, no matter how small mm -hmm. in numbers, or big in numbers, uh, to exercise their right to protect the First Amendment. Well, that's, that's awesome that you did that, and I think that, uh, that it will, will inspire in the future a lot of other journalists to stand up and, you know, bring out the truth uh, about, you know, whatever it is that's going on uh, in our political landscape. So, you know, when talking about Trump, it's kind of inevitable for us to talk about the tweets, right? Okay. So I'm going to ask one question about the tweets. You know, he is uh, on there, uh, he talks about policies before anyone else knows about them, and so how does, how does that... Uh, affect the news cycle? Two things here. First of all, there is a problem of tweeting US policies in a limited number of characters. Why is this a problem? The problem is because Trump administration always say how um, they want to have a substantial conversation and they accuse the press, they accuse us of not wanting to have substantial conversation. Okay. Let's take this argument into consideration for a second, right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, Mr. President, if you really want to have a substantial conversation about something, then you need to be willing to sit down at a table with people with substance and to hear and take in what we have to tell to you, what, what kind of input and criticism we want to provide so you can be better so this country can be better because it's not about the president, it is about the country. It's always about the country. So if they really want to have substantial conversation, they, they need to put uh, all part, uh, partisanship aside mm -hmm. and be open to hear from academia, from journalists, from independent political thinkers, from youth, 
but not only Republican youth, they need to include everyone because he said at the beginning that he wants to be the president of all people. So if you really want to be a president of all people, you know, let, let's see that. Sit Definitely. down with everyone, listen to uh, criticism, and stop throwing talking points, points at the American public. You cannot have substantial conversation if you're all the time throwing talking points at the American public, and that, that is the problem. The second thing here that you ask me is about how does this affect the news cycle? Mm -hmm. And it's dumping down the news cycle for sure, mm -hmm. because, and it's connected with, with the question of mm -hmm. substance, because what he tweets has no substance. I'm really sorry to say this, but that's my honest opinion. His tweets have no substance because it's very hard to have substance in uh, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, he affects the news cycle uh, to be one chaotic news cycle. Mm -hmm. He wants to keep the White House press corps uh, all the time on our toes. Mm -hmm. uh, you never know when your day ends. Uh, they can send you home and then they can send out the message and say, uh, okay, uh, the pool on duty, you know, has the lead after until 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened in case of Syria, because they didn't want to say what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. it was very clear because the president didn't have anything on, on his schedule mm -hmm. that something is, that something was coming mm -hmm. on the news cycle. And he likes to turn uh, the Friday news dump into mm -hmm. a full-on news cycle. And it's very tiring, and um, it's not organized, it's chaotic, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, as a journalist, you cannot complain. I mean, you can in the privacy, you know, <laughs> uh, of the backstage, uh, and we can, we can say, oh, we just <laughs> need, you know, one day of sleep, but uh, at the end of the day, he, he needs to um, take more responsibility as to how he's treating the press. Because it reflects on him, it doesn't reflect on us. Well, Ksenia, to wrap up this uh, this conversation, I would like to ask you uh, one more question. What is the future of journalism uh, here in the U.S., and what is the future for Deep Pavlovic today? Wow, um, the future of journalism, that's the big question to ask me. Um, the future of journalism depends on the survival of journalism. We are currently fighting for our lives. Because when you are working as a journalist in the environment where someone is all the time trying to undermine the or trust discredit. in your work, to discredit you, exactly, uh, when you are working in such a hostile environment and you are, you know, doing this, you know, having the President of the United States on the other side of your work, mm -hmm. it's very hard. So we are now basically struggling for, for the survival of our values, of ethical values of journalism profession. We are um, basically fighting the good fight uh, for the survival of truth, uh, for the survival of journalism ethics, high standards, um, and uh, the future depends on that. So I would rather say that if you want to see the future that is optimistic and positive and healthy, mm -hmm. we need to be very, very diligent right now and to basically uphold the biggest, um, the highest, the highest standards of our profession. Uh, as for Pavlovic today, I. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing my own way and um, I, I'm just hoping that more people are going to start you know, joining me in my, my mission, in my journey and uh, then we are going to meet mm -hmm. <laughs> in that future that mm -hmm. you asked me about. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, Ksenia, thank you so much for being here with me and answering uh, those questions. Uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in for our conversation. If you haven't already, please check out thepavlovictoday.com and follow them on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. And thank you. I am Jacqueline Villalparroyo, and this is Ksenia Pavlovic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everyone. Bye.